I had uh, uh, I'd been out of high school for about three years. I, I'd gone to college for a, a year, and I uh, found out I majored too much in beer and women. And uh, so I ended up getting a pretty good job in a factory and going to night school, trying to get a degree in uh, um, in the law enforcement. Mm. And uh, then uh, they changed the uh, deferment for students in uh, 65 or 66 okay. and uh, put me on the chopping block and I knew I was going to go. So um, I didn't want to get drafted. And I also didn't want to go in for four years because I was already, you know, pushing 21. Mm. And uh, so ran into a few of my good buddies and yeah, and uh, we all decided that we were going to go into the Marines. If we were going to go, we were going to go to Vietnam anyway. We might as, might as well go with the best. And that's basically yeah. what, what happened. My very first fire base uh, about three days after I got in country was Contien right on the DMZ yeah. and so we were pretty pretty much under fire most of the time we were there and uh, so we were just looking out for everybody each other you know and that was about it but wow. they called me the short timer because I had less than a year to do uh, every you know everybody else was pulling the 13 month tour and I was uh, I did 11 basically all up, up right around 11 months. You arrive in i Corps in November 67. Uh, did you fly into Da Nang? We flew into Da Nang, yes. What was your first impression of Vietnam when the doors and the plane open up, or maybe when you're looking out the window on the way in? What was your first impression of the place? Um, well, when I was flying in, looking out the window, basically it looked almost like a, a town you know uh you know until we got over the base and then you you could t tell it was a military base and uh you know when the doors opened up it was uh, hot humid and it had a a smell that uh, probably i'll never forget mm -hmm. and uh as we're getting off the plane they're telling us that we need to you know hurry you know, walk at a, at a good pace because they, they only had a certain amount of time on the on the ground before they had to take off. And as we were leaving the plane, there was, there was other Marines and Army guys and, you know, other, other GIs there getting ready to get on. So as soon as we got off, they got on and the plane took off. What memories do you have about those guys waiting to get on the plane? Well, it was most of them looked pretty bad. I mean, they, you know, they, 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 their utilities were, you know, red colored, and some looked good, some looked sharp, um, and uh, you know, they were, you know, they were that you'll be sorry, you know, a little a few comments like that, not a whole lot. They were more, they were more, I think, grateful just to get on the plane and get the heck out of there. What was this war all about? Suppose the Marine right behind you, you know, just as a thought thought experiment, let's say you guys are stopped for a second and the Marine, the Marine behind you says, what are we doing here? Why are we here? Now, this is at the beginning. You haven't got to Contien, Contien yet. You haven't got to Quezon yet. Right at the very beginning, the first five minutes. What do you think you might have said in November 67 why Tom Northrop is in South Vietnam? I think it was more like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, but uh, I, I'm not real sure it really sunk in right at that moment. Um, I think later on in the day when we were going through processing and uh, getting our uh, in-country orders where we were going to go. Uh, and uh, then they put us on a, uh, a watch that night with no weapons. And um, come to find out it was actually, they took us out there in the dark and then we came back in the morning, but it was just a village. It was within Da Nang and it was obviously it was secure. But, uh, and then we got, got on a plane, uh, C-130 and they flew us up to Dong Ha. Mm -hmm. And that's where they issued us our, uh, our 782 gear and our uh, M-16 and, you know, the ammunition, et cetera. And uh, 
I was uh, actually assigned to uh, Echo Company, who won. Uh, and they were out on an operation. They were out on uh, a two or three day uh, sweep up up in uh, what they called Leatherneck Square uh, right. back in the day. And uh, just north of Dong Ha, up, up, up on the other side of the river. And uh, they came back. And when they came back, they we they started calling off our guys. And they said there was like three or four of us that had came in that, that day. And uh, we were going to, everybody was getting transferred to Bravo Company 1-1. Uh, apparently, uh, one of the platoons in Bravo Company had been involved in some kind of a civilian, quote, massacre or, mm -hmm. you know, killing some civilians. And uh, so they shipped them all over to Hawaii for uh, an investigation. So we, we, that's how I got to Contien. It, because uh, one one was up at Contien, all all four companies from the first first battalion. Wow! So with like I said, three four days, and I was up up in the hot zone. First time I had ever heard a real live artillery round come up come in, and you know, and we're we're walking up the 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 road, and we got minesweepers in front of us, and. Uh, Income, this incoming, and everybody's hitting the deck, and me and the other two guys, we're standing there like, "What is that?" Mm. And all of a sudden, we realized it was wow. artillery round. And was it coming over the DMZ? It was coming from the DM. Yes, from the DMZ. Mo yeah, yeah. How long had you been in country then when this happened? When you experienced this artillery coming in for the first time? That was like three days. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we got off the truck. They sent us to Cantian, got off the trucks, and walked in with minesweepers in front of us. And then that allowed the trucks to come in behind us. Every day, every time a convoy came into Cantian, they had to do a minesweep because the gooks would come in in the middle of the night, set, you know, set the mines back out there. I mean, the fighting had been going on in and around Cantian for months by this point. It, yes. Um, what what did the place actually look like after months of artillery bombardment and tanks and battles and all of this? What did Kantian actually look like at this time? Uh, it was during the monsoon season. So it was muddier than hell. Sandbags and trenches everywhere. Um, spent ammo boxes, you know, in a few places. And, and you know, and then we ended up. Actually, where I was located at, uh, where where my platoon was, um, we actually faced the DMZ. We were right on the northern section of the DMZ, and there was a uh, forward observation post there that was that sat up on probably about ten or twelve feet up in the air. It was all surrounded by uh, sandbags, and they had powerful scopes in there to keep the eye on what was going on across the DMZ. We could see them. We could see the Jeeps running around over there. And then that forward observe uh, that uh, the observation post would periodically call in artillery strikes on the D you know, on that side of the DMZ oh. and, and air strikes and et cetera. And then there would be a little bit of a lull and all of a sudden they start coming back at us. By the time I got there, most of the uh, artillery where they were getting, you know, to anywhere up to eight or nine hundred rounds incoming a day was down to about three or four hundred. And then it was just like an exchange. You know, we would fire at them and then they would fire at us. And then there'd be a little there'd be a lull for a couple hours. And uh, we had probably. On our perimeter, we probably had about 50 meters of barbed wire and booby traps. Uh, that they would have to come through if they if they made a uh, an assault a ground assault. Did they ever try when you were there? Uh, yes, they did. Yeah. How did yeah. it go? But they never got much past about the fourth or fifth row of Constantina. They would come in with uh, um, their the first squad. Usually, when they hit, was just bodies to lay down on the 
on the barbed wire and blow it up with uh, Bangalore torpedoes and satchel charges, things like that. And then the next wave would come in behind them and just kind of step on them and come over and they would try to move in one wave at a time. But they never got very far. They didn't even get probably halfway up. And you kind of knew that there was something going on because you could hear some hooting and hollering back uh, in, at night back over that direction. So you kind of knew there was something probably going to happen. Across the DMZ. What I hear about um, Northern i you know, and I listen to Marines describe Northern i at this time, you're there, 67, 68. Some of the things remind me of World War One. these artillery barrages, what you described, these guys, you know, hitting the wire, these sort of frontal assaults. Um, some Marines also talk about just the rats that were everywhere, which, of course, you hear about in World War One as well. Does that does that ring any bell oh, yeah. for you? Oh, yeah. They were they were everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Guys would get bit, you know, um, you just had to be careful at night. You know, uh, you didn't see them. They didn't. And it depended on actually where you were at. If you were someplace where they were throwing sea ration cans out into the wire and all that stuff, that attracted the rats. And it attracted the uh, the, the the rock apes. And, uh, and so it was kind of, you know, try to, you know, keep your area clean because that's what, that's what happens. And, but every once in a while we'd get one down in our bunker. Yeah. Yeah, most of our bunkers were underground there. You know, the the uh, CB, I, like I said, by the time I got there, that that probably been there a year and a half or maybe even two years. Uh, yeah. So it was pretty well fortified. And we had tanks right there with us. Army, uh, a division of Army tanks were, were right there on uh, uh, kind of like there was three or four of them that were in a row as you came up to our, our position and they were kind of flanked out, out towards the east. You got a lot of very stressful things happening simultaneously. You're a young man. And I'm just wondering, you know, how long does it take before you come up with some strategy to deal with this so you don't, so you can keep it together and do your job? I think uh, I, I can't speak for the other branches, but I can tell you that it was uh, it was the Marine Corps, the Marines in us that kept us together, supporting each other. We had each other's back. Um, we could turn a, a bad situation into a laughing, you know, uh, we could, you know, make a joke out of it. But uh, we supported each other. Uh, mm -hmm. when I first got there, I wasn't treated like an outsider. I was treated like, you know, you guys are here. We're going to, we're going to train. We're going to do this. We're going to keep up. Um, and basically I think it was the team concept that we had in the, in the Marines that kind of kept your mind off of what was going on around you. Other than the fact that, you know, that they're trying to kill you. So now you got to try to kill them. And it became a survival thing, you know? Right. So what I'm hearing you say is you've got all these stressors coming at you. And then that's kind of a force. So you think of it. And then the counter force is knowing that I can trust the Marine on my left. I can trust the Marine on my right. They could both trust me. We can all trust each other. And we're going to get through this thing together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was like that for the whole time I was there. Mm hmm. How long were you in Kantian? We were there about 30 days, I think. We I got uh, we left uh, before Christmas, not too long before Christmas. Uh, actually, I, they sent me down to Da Nang to a uh, uh, mine warfare and booby trap uh, training for mm -hmm. a week or two. I can't remember if it was two weeks or one week. Uh, to learn how to diffuse mines and, you know, and how to look for booby traps and, and uh, all the different things that the, that the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong and the, it would be used against us, you know, the punji pits and the, uh, the, the uh, bouncing beddies and, the, and the, the, the mines and, and so forth. So then by the time I got done there, it was Christmas and they, uh, our unit had moved from Kantian to Quang Tree. So we, we in Quang Tree, we uh, 
we were in support. It was a uh, the uh, it was an ar- it was basically an army base and a helicopter uh, support. It's where most of the helicopters that were flying up into the DMZ came from was there at Quang Tree. So we did perimeter watch there, and then we also did what they we also went out into the villages that that were uh, surrounding just outside the wire and down by the river and around and out in the rice paddies and spent nights with the, uh, with the people in the villages. And uh, that was for protection for them from the VC. And then we'd come back and spend a couple of days back on the hill and then we'd rotate back in into a village or something. And uh, that's what, it, and then on one day a week, I think it was Wednesday, uh, we had like a med cap to where we brought food and supplies to the people and and brought a couple of corpsmen down and a doctor and gave them shots and checked them out uh, medically and all that, you know, all that good stuff. And that's what, you know, that's what I thought we were there for. I mean, other than being up on the DMZ, the very, but I felt at that time, that's why we're here. We're here to protect these people from the VC in, the, in, in North Vietnam. Vietnam. And uh, uh, so we were there about, we were there all the way through January to probably about uh, 24th or 25th of January, I think, and we moved to Fubai. And then uh, we went into way about three days after uh, the Tet started. You're in these villages and you're protecting the Viet- the villagers from the Viet Cong. Um, and also part of the, you know, it's the hearts and minds things. You talked about the medical, the medical assistance and all of that. Um, trying to win them over to the, the government side, the side of South Vietnam. What was your impression of the, the people of um, these, these Vietnamese villagers? What was your impression of them? Um, what, what was their impression of you so far as, as you could tell? They actually liked us. Now, whether or not that was a facade, you know, or whatever, they they welcomed us. We slept in their homes with them. You know, uh, I mean, we kept some guys that were, you know, outside. There was no trenches or anything. We, we were just in the villages to protect the uh, to protect the villagers. And the kids, they all ran around. They came around. You know, we'd give them the gum and we'd give them candy and you know, and they would, uh, you know, they'd laugh with us and uh, Papa San and Mama San brought us in. They'd cook for us. So mm-hmm. I felt in the village, I felt like we were, you know, they were very good people, really good people. You know, they just wanted this thing to get over with and get back to their lives. So you go down to Way, then um, Way is hit. What I think right at the very beginning of Tet, right? So January 30th, yes. 68. Yep. And so you've already seen combat in Kantian, and then you've got this duty in Da Nang, this training in Da Nang. Now you're in Quang Tri, and then you're going out to the villages. Tet hits at the end of January 68. So I'm interested in hearing a bit about that then. What was your first, what's the first thing you remember um about tet knowing that you know something i was going to say something big was underway you've already experienced big up in Kantian, but for south vietnam as a whole you know something really big is underway what, what's the first recollection you have of of tet well actually i we didn't really know that something big was going on uh when they shipped us up there um we knew that Alpha Company had gone up and they'd gotten into some trouble. And we knew that there was another Marine unit that had gone up there. We, and uh, so we, they put us on a convoy and they told us we'd probably just go up there for a day or two. The way. Yeah. And uh, on the way in on Highway 9, uh, Highway 1, the, uh, there was a bunch of... Um, Arvin tanks that had been blown up in that area there before we got uh, to the to the actual city away. And the bridge that we were supposed to go across to go in had already been blown up right. because it was more than just the Pearl River there. There was a couple of other rivers that came in and some 
waterways and so forth. So there was quite a few bridges in, in way. So our objective was to take uh, another bridge and hold it. And that's what we did. We took the bridge. Um, we set up a, a, a perimeter on both ends of the bridge and we hunkered down for what I thought was one night. And uh, uh, when I woke up, it was uh, about 12 days later and they were sending me home. My father had passed away and I was going home uh, on emergency leave. Somehow they found me. That's another story that uh, uh, how they found me is, 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 is a different story. But I do not remember from that first day till the day that they came. And it was, they came and got me on the 12th of February so that I could be home for the funeral. And that, I want to ask you about how they found you, but that whole time and way has is just sort of washed from your memory. You don't remember? Gone. It's gone. Don't remember, don't remember anything about it. I, I mean, I couldn't tell you what we, I, I don't even have, you know, uh, thoughts or dreams or just, you know, just fleeting things. I don't, I, I, I can't remember anything. Wow. And I know we were, I know we were in the, in the ship. Excuse my, uh, my language. But yeah. I, uh, and as a matter of fact, the day that I left, um, the ceiling was so low, had been so low that there was no, uh, they weren't bringing in any uh, artillery strikes or any uh, air, air strikes. And so they were only uh, taking out the wounded, no dead. And, and nobody like me were getting on choppers and leaving in the morning. But they said it would, you know, and then all of a sudden about, I'd say probably around noonish, the sun came out and then in came the airstrikes and the chopper started landing and taking the wounded and all of us guys out of there. And that morning, uh, that's when I was, uh, I was, I was a squad leader then. I, they moved me up from fire team leader to squad leader. And uh, supposedly I was supposed to be in a meeting that morning with the uh, squad leaders meeting and they took an incoming round. It was a short round came in and uh, killed a couple of the guys that I knew and uh, wounded a couple. And while I was waiting for the chopper to come, they pulled those guys up in the back of a six by and uh, put the, put the body bags on a chopper and uh, left the wounded guys there. And we shot the shit for about an hour or so. So the skies lifted and then they took us all out. This, this was the, this was your, your 12th day in, in way. These are the things you remember your, your last. Yeah. yeah. But, Everything in between arriving, coming up from Fubai and, and that, you don't remember? I don't remember anything. Nothing. Wow. I mean, you said the story of how they were able to find you to get the news to you about your dad. Um, that, that was, that's a story in itself. What's the, what's the basic outline of that? Well, when my father was a preacher, a Methodist preacher, and um, he had the habit of watching the news every night to see if, you know, cause at that time, Walter Cronkite and all of them were on every, you know, every night, you know, showing what was going on. And sure. somehow I guess they knew I was in way. I, I, I must, I might've wrote them a letter. I don't know. But uh, when he, when my father passed, my brother who was, I had a brother that had just gotten out of the air force. And I had another brother that was in Okinawa in the air force. And so my brother in Okinawa got, uh, got a hold of the red cross and, uh, told the red cross to, that, uh, you know, bring me home. They said, well, where he's at, we don't, there's no way we're going to be able to find it. And, uh, <clears throat> one of the, uh, one of the men from my dad's church knew my high school principal real well. And his brother was the mayor of Syracuse and a good friend of uh, Governor Rockefeller. So there was phone calls made and they found me. You're out of the world of war 
for a while. Now you're going back and you learn some, you know, somewhere before you get there that the Marines are now in Quezon, um, in uh, Western Northern I Corps now, not far from the Laotian border. And surely you know just from the time you spent up in I Corps that that's going to be a that's going to be a whole nother rough situation. What was your own thinking about that, having experienced combat, but then having been out of it for a while, and now getting knowing that you're going to head right back into the thick of it? What was your own thinking about that? Um, I was just I uh, I was pretty nervous about it. You know, I I. Um, I, like I said, I thought I was going to go into the armory, but because they were at that point, they were getting ready. They hadn't made the decision yet, but they were, they were in the process of abandoning Quezon of which we did not know in the, in, you know, in the, you know, down in the lower ranks, we had no idea what was going on. We only knew what they would feed us. Um, so when I got there that, uh, and I went right up onto 950. That's where I, uh, uh, and so we were up on 950 for a couple of weeks. And it was a listening post, basically, to uh, keep track of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that came down uh, through mm -hmm. Laos. And then next to 950 was 1015, which had snipers, uh, NBA snipers. So we were always, we were getting sniped at pretty much every day, you know, wow. and uh we did. We didn't run any patrols off there because the only way to get up there was by chopper, and uh, so it, and, and it was, that's where the rats were. <laughs> the rats and the rock apes were uh, really big time. I want to ask you about these snipers, but let me ask you about the um, the rock apes real real quick. I mean, it, it sounds like a like an insignificant question, but I've heard about these things before. Um, what memories do you have of them? What sort of things would they would they do? Well, they would throw rocks at us. I mean, <laughs> it, they, yeah, and usually at night, you know, they kind of you, at first, you know, you think it's the you know Charlie or something, but then you realize it, you know, you're getting pelted by rocks, and uh, they were all up because they, it was nothing but jungle on that section. And yeah. one day there was a. a I'd call it a herd. I don't know what you call them, but it was probably about 10 or 15 of them that were just coming down through the trees and just, you know, jumping from tree to tree to tree. And it was kind of interesting to watch them do it. And uh, they went on down a little down below us, but what well, 950 turned into a big garbage dump because all you did was eat your sea rations and throw them off the side of the hill. Yeah. And that's where we really had a rat infestation. We had, Several guys get bit by rats up there. One guy, uh, one corpsman, he uh, blew his big toe off shooting at one uh, in his uh, in his bunker one night. Uh, I don't know why he decided to shoot at it, but he did and blew his toe off. Um, so that you know, and then up there in the jungle, that was that was really the only jungle I was we were I was ever in, and we had centipedes that were probably. Uh, 18 to 24 inches long up in the trees and uh, all kinds of bugs and, and, and mosquitoes. And, and it was humid. It was like 110 degrees and, you know, 99% of humidity. And it was just all you did was just sweat all day and all night. Yeah. I'm just, you know, um, you mentioned the mosquitoes, the heat, the humidity, the snipers, and then you've got these apes throwing rocks at you at night. And, you know, it must feel like, the whole world is against us here. I mean, we got the the ants and the rats and the snakes and the mosquitoes and the and the apes and the NVA. Everybody's against us. It's just the Marines, really, just shoulder to shoulder. I, I want to ask you about you. So you've got these NVA snipers. So did that mean then during the day that you're just kind of hunkered down all day? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. Just hunkered down. Pretty much in the trench. Yeah moving around in the trenches. We had pretty deep trenches. Okay. And uh, I mean, if you look at that picture, you'll see that it was it was fortified pretty pretty well. And then there was an LZ right down at uh, off of one part of it. And that's where the supply choppers would come in and we'd have to run down, grab our supplies and then, you know, book back up the hill and, 
you know, dole out, dole out all the uh, sea rations and uh, ammunition. We were on a, we had left 881. We had moved around a couple of times uh, to different hills, but our main hill that we were uh, to man was 881 South. So they had an operation that was going. So every time there was an operation going, there would be one platoon or something would come in and man the hill while they were the, the other unit was on an operation. So we were uh, on the 30th, um, they dropped us, we came down onto Highway 9 and they dropped us off on Highway 9. And we uh, we set up a patrol and a sweep with another, with uh, I believe it was Alpha Company, was the other company with us. And so it was a two company size uh, operation. And uh, we we made a sweep that, that day, heading towards, uh, heading away from Quezon. Nice. And uh, so then we dug in for the night and we were we were going to go to a hill. I don't know if it was I, I really do not know if it was Hill 689, but 689 was in that general direction. But there was a company it was Echo Company was uh, had they were they were getting in firefights with the NVA. They had them surrounded and, you know, they were pummel on so about 4 35 o'clock in the morning it was still dark all hell broke loose up on that hill and you could see the tracers going back and forth in the explosions you know and the you know and everything so we saddled up and we were heading in that direction and uh i was my squad we were tail end charlie and we were uh I think Alpha Company, I believe, was to our right, and we were on the left, and I was on the far left. In a, we were in a V formation, and I was in the far left tail end, Charlie, with my squad, and uh, and all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. There was probably a couple, maybe a couple of thousand NBA wow. had set up an ambush. You know, they they basically suckered us in. And uh, we kind of knew, you know, we we knew that morning we were pulling out that we were going to get in, into some shit. We, we knew it, you know, down in the ranks. Uh, so we got, uh, once they got, got us pinned down, they had a couple of uh, platoons pinned down. Uh, I got a call from the, uh, from my uh, platoon commander that there was a, uh, machine gun unit that got separated from the rest of us and, and, and they were close by where we were at and wanted me to uh, send a couple of fire teams and myself over and bring them back in because they they, uh, they they were basically lost they were cut off so we moved up through this what I call a dry wash and uh, there was a, a wash out underneath it almost like a little cave that went back in a, you know maybe five or six feet and I left my radio operator there with uh, with our platoon uh, sergeant, staff sergeant, and took my two fire teams because that's all I had at that time. Uh, we were very undermanned in strength. Um, and we had a couple of new guys, and uh, so we went up and I and and I could hear a machine gun, and I I didn't know if it was ours or them. I couldn't really tell the difference and I had my fire one fire team up above me on my right and I had my other fire team right down below me on my left and I yelled out you know what I can't remember their designation uh, exactly what they what it was but I yelled out for them well it turned out that was the NVA position and they they started firing back at us and throwing uh, chai comms at us and so uh, my point man, who was the, probably the best point man in all of Vietnam, he would see the Chai Coms coming and call them out. And then we would throw back. So about that time, probably we were about into this fight for about maybe, I don't know, it just went by so fast, probably five or 10 minutes. And a machine gun unit had heard what was going on and they came around and got came up behind us. So then, you know, it was 
basically a successful mission. Mm. So we started pulling back. And as we pulled back, they threw a couple more chai comms, got one of, one of my guys in the stomach. He was right behind me. So it landed in between me and him. But chai comms actually blow in one direction. And they're more of a concussion grenade. They're meant to, to wound you so that they can, you know, they have to cart you off. Well, got him in the in the abdomen. So we went back and we got him and uh, me and another uh, Marine got him. And as we're bringing him down, another chai comm hit the other Marine in the foot and blew and uh, I, it didn't blow his foot off, but it pretty much blew it off. It was just hanging there. So I turned around, I got them back down. I turned around, laid down some ground fire, threw a bunch of uh, about three or four more grenades up in there. And then everything went quiet. So I figured we'll probably, you know, probably knocked it out, I guess. And uh, so then we pulled back down and most of the fighting was was pretty much over by that time because it all was happening in front of us. So the lieutenant called me up. I told him where I was at. He said, well, come up the hill. And we got up on the, the crest of the hill. And it was all elephant grass up in there. I mean, it was real high elephant grass. And uh there was, about, there was five dead Marines laying there uh, mm. face up on the ground and they had a, pr a prisoner and uh, uh, you know, the, the way the Vietnamese spoke, it was almost like they laughed, you know, they had that high pitch tone in their voice and they, and they spoke real quick, you know, uh, in their, in their lingo. And, uh, you know, we kind of thought he was laughing. So, you know, it really pissed us off and, one of the guys wanted to blow his, you know, pull his 45 out and wanted to blow him away. And we had to stop that. And they, they carted him off. So then we regrouped, we pulled back down off of the hill, probably about a quarter of a mile or more, uh, almost back to where we had started out early that morning and called in uh, airstrikes. We were supposed to go up and, and relieve, uh, relieve Echo Company up on the top of the whatever hill that was and i really don't remember if it was 689 or 689. if it was just where they had spent a couple of nights I, I really don't know so so this this ambush hit your marines when you were on your way to those to echo company yes um so you never you never connected with echo company then not that day okay not that day we we actually pulled back brought brought in the airstrikes napalm and and clusters and daisy chains and i mean they just hit hit the hell out of the hill and then we had to go back up we still had about three or four uh, marines that we left up on the hill so we had to, we went back up and got them and brought them down and uh loaded them, everybody up on a couple of tanks and, and uh, tanks took off with the you know with the and the choppers took the wounded and the tanks took the took the dead marine we lost 13 Marines that day and 32 wounded. That was probably the biggest firefight I was in. It was that that long and that many that I, that we lost it in that short a period of time. It probably lasted no more than a total of four or five hours from start to finish. How long was it before you realized that that had happened on Memorial Day? that day because um, we went back to where we started from where we had dug in the night before and made it, we encamped again and one of the guys in my squad had a had a transistor radio and we listened to the Indy 500 mm. on armed forces radio rats the rock apes the mosquitoes the mud the filth all of these things that would just be horrible and then now on top of that of course you throw the the nba and everything that they have and and the question was you know how do you hold it together how do you not you know just lose it and your answer was well you you're in it together with your fellow marines and so there's that strong bond um and then you have a day like this where you you lose a lot of your fellow Marines um, and you have to carry on, you know, the next day comes and you've got to keep going. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how do you, how do you do that? You've got this incredibly strong bond with your fellow Marines. 
but just the nature of the situation you're in, if they're lost in battle, I don't know, do you just kind of, you just kind of have to let go and move on and think about it later? I mean, how does that go? Uh, I can't really tell you what kind of mindset it was, um, it, it, but it was like, it was just another day at the beach. Yeah. You know, I mean, you just, because we knew we weren't leaving there anytime soon. You know, we all had our time to do and we all, you know, and we, we were counting down days and, you know, but we all knew that we were there and we were there together. And uh, that was, uh, that was the crux of it. And uh, the day after uh, that battle, we spent a day at, on Hill 558 down in the perimeter they took us down to the river so we could take a bath and we took a bath down in the river uh, and then came back up. And then the next morning we went back down where we were during the firefight, but came in from a different direction and we had a different company with us. We had Charlie company with us then, and they were the front runner, the front company and they moved up and got and and we were able to uh, drive the NBA off of the hill that had uh, Echo Company surrounded. Lost a couple more Marines that day, um, and a couple more wounded, but it wasn't quite as bad as Memorial Day. On Memorial Day, there was a Marine that, uh, his name was Gatewood, and he, uh, um, we thought nobody, no, somebody uh, saw him get wounded. And, and, uh, as we were, as they were sweeping and for some reason, they thought that he had either was either sent off on the chopper, you know, because she was wounded. And, uh, it was about two or three days later that they figured that, no, he was MIA. Wow. Uh, they had no idea. It took them two or three days to figure out that he, no, he, he wasn't choppered out. There was no record of him. And that, you know, that took, took a, you know, several days to, to get back up to the, uh, to the headquarters. Was Gatewood ever found, do you know? No, it was never found. What does that silver star mean to you? Um, means a lot more to me now than it did at that time mm. um it gives me uh a certain amount of uh pride and uh to be able to look back and say you know this is what i did but i i, I don't brag about it i don't i mean people know but i don't uh, i don't bring it up and one thing that <clears throat> uh, I I go to a lot of um, I, I belong to the Marine Corps League, so I go to a lot of uh, Marine Corps League functions and stuff in the state. And there's always somebody that introduces me as hey, you got to meet Tom. <sighs> he, he's a Silver Star winner. I'm going, no, I didn't win it. No, I didn't. I did not win it. No. I mean, I, it is what it is, you know, I mean, it, uh, and I really don't think that what I did on that particular day was anything different than what I did the, the rest of the time I was over there. I mean, you know, we, we, you just do things and you, and, uh, what we, it's what we were trained for. What memories do you have of the case of Tom Mahoney? Um, he he goes missing. I is it? I believe is it um, a few weeks after this, right? If I remember right. Yeah, but a month afterwards, it was July. About a month after. Yeah. Um, again, it, uh, we were right at the very end of the uh, shutdown of Kason, and uh, we'd been. Uh, we had 
we knew that there was Buku NVA roaming the whole area around there. And yeah. we were engaged, you know, everybody was engaging with them. We engaged with them another time after that uh, on a on an operation that we did uh, on between 881 South and 881 North. Uh, we got into a, a small firefight with them and they just took off. But uh, we had, uh, we were, we'd caved in most of the bunkers and the trench lines and we'd uh, gotten rid of all of our excess ordnance. We blew it all up in a crater down on one end of the hill there. And uh, we uh, pretty much destroyed all the uh, latrines and the shitters and, you know, except for one. And we were, at that time, we quit. It was about two weeks. We were not allowed, we weren't running any more patrols out outside. Up until that point, we were running uh, squad size and platoon size patrols day and night. And uh, so we, they just said, "That's this is it. We're, we're they're coming to get us." And they were supposed to come and get us around the first, right around the first of July. And uh, they never, they didn't come. And they, you know, now we're sleeping out under the stars. We our bunkers are all caved in. Our trench line pretty much caved in. Uh, you know, we're we're we got just enough ammunition to carry out. And uh, you know, and and we were supposed to go. They were supposed to come by, get us by a chopper and take us to Quang Tree, back down to Quang Tree. And that, so we had a squad leader every, every day. They're telling us the same thing. Choppers are coming tomorrow. They'll be here in the morning sometime, you know, between seven and nine. And, you know, every, every day that was going on. Yeah. Well, finally, uh, uh, on the 6th of July, uh, we're out now. Remember, this is, uh, 110, 115 degree heat. And we're, you know, we're, we're out in the sun. You know, I mean, we got other than our poncho liners is about all we had to protect us from the, from the sun. We're rationed two canteens of water a day. We're eating nothing but sea rations, which we'd been doing that for two months. And uh, all of a sudden I heard a uh, 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 couple of, couple of rounds go off down at the, uh, down on the corner down there in Northwest End where the gate was that we went out. Or that's where we pretty much went out and came back in. And uh, all of a sudden there was all kinds of traffic on the radio. And, you know, we got a Marine, we got a Marine uh, outside the wire and we got Charlie out there. And so my, they told me to stay in my trench line and defend that area in case the MVA came up. And where I was at, we had a, a clear view of fire. We had a, a excellent uh, way to, you know, see them if they were coming up. It was all cleared from the napalm and the Agent Orange and all that stuff. It was nothing but, you know, mm -hmm. dirt. And uh, so what, we stayed there while they were going down to uh, try to recover Tom's uh, body. Not knowing that he was dead, they sent um, they sent uh, a couple of guys out. I think I uh, can't remember who went out first, but uh, they they, got, they went out and they had the NBA had dragged Tom's body out in the open to where if we went to retrieve his body, they had an ambush set up. And uh, at that time, nobody really knew he was dead or alive. Uh, apparently. He was dead because when the first guy went out there before he got hit, he saw nothing but blood. He said there was a, just a, a huge pool of blood and he wasn't moving. So when the first guy got hit, they came back. And uh, and at that point, um, I had a uh, CS canister, uh, canister, which is tear gas, that threw out about... Nine, about four or five hundred pellets of, of uh, tear gas looked like little bullets, little. And uh, so I set that off. Half my squad didn't have uh, gas masks, and uh, so I I sent most of those. I sent all those guys down to the other end of the trench. We set off that canister, and uh, after that cleared out, I went. I worked my way down to the gate where 
everything was going on. And they had, I think they had up made a second pass and another Marine was, was killed. And he got very close to uh, Tom and he said, oh yeah, he's, he's, he's dead, you know? And then we were getting ready to do a third or maybe a fourth time. And we got called off. We were told uh, uh, the skipper said he got word from uh, the battalion commander that we had uh, we were pulling off the hill. Um, so at that point, we realized that they had our LZ zeroed in. So they knew where the choppers were going to come in to take us off the hill. But we had to move the LZ to the far end all the way, which was I'd say four or 500 meters uh, mm. up the hill uh, on the main 881. So we grabbed everything we could and we were going to, Lieutenant wanted to stay with a couple of us guys and we volunteered, a couple of us volunteered to stay there with them, spend the night and then try to bring Tom in in the morning. And uh, that, that got, that got blitzed. And uh, so we, uh, we ended up getting on the choppers, and uh, we lost a couple of more wounded. We didn't we didn't get any KIAs that day, but we got several wounded, and uh, and we pulled off the pulled off the hill, and went right to Hill Six Eighty Nine, where they had a, they were completely surrounded by probably three four thousand MVA. Good grief! So now, so. As these Marines are going out to try to recover Tom's body, um, did you say that one was killed in the process of trying to do? No, that? nobody was. No, they both both guys got shot. One guy got shot in the shoulder. Okay. One guy got shot in the neck. Okay. As you're flying, and we were throwing grenades back and forth. They were throwing grenades at us. We were throwing grenades at them. One of our guys got, uh, you know, got some shrapnel from one of the grenades. So we, right there, we had probably three wounded, but the rest of the wounded was when we were getting to the choppers, trying to get to the choppers. And you're going, and you're getting on these choppers to go to 689 to support the Marines who are there? Yes. So you're going from there into that combat situation. And we knew we were going to 689. Uh, that morning, we had a squad leader's briefing, but we were supposed to leave, again, we were supposed to leave, you know, before noon. And it looked like they weren't coming to get us again because, you know, this didn't happen till late in the afternoon, some probably around three o'clock or three thirty, somewhere around there. So we just figured it was going to be another day of another night of hunkering down. Uh, so you've got a lot, you know, going on, everything that's happened, you know, that you're going into an, yet another combat situation up on 689. So when you get on that helo and you fly out you're, and you know that you're going into another combat situation, in your own mind at that moment, have you just let Tom go? Or does it really bother you that you know that Tom is there, but we didn't get him? Or are you just thinking about the next thing to come and not really not really thinking about it at that moment? No, no, never, never let him go. No. None of us did. But we see, and we were under the impression, uh, we were told by our skipper that a recon team went and retrieved his body about three or four days later. That's what we were told. So at that point, we kind of said, okay, you know, he's going home. So it was just another casualty at that point. And the, the other thing, that uh, uh, that we all believed in is that he was killed and it saved a bunch of lives because we had no idea the NVA were that close. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just, and when they started dropping in the mortars and the rockets on our LZ, then we knew we had to move the LZ, which saved a bunch of lives that day. So, uh, we felt that it uh, at least there was something positive that came out of it. Came out of it. But you no, know, when we got when we got over to six eighty nine, uh, my squad and uh, I, we were only we were down to two squads at the time 
less than 10 guys per squad. You know, and a squad is normally 15 and you got three squads in a, in a platoon. And we got over to 689 and we all huddled around and said a prayer for town. Wow. I'm guessing this, the officer told you a few days later that a recon team had got him. Maybe he believed that. My guess would be he told you that just so that you could kind of have some relief, maybe. Do, do you think that's why he said that to you? I, I don't, I, I'm not real sure. The lieutenant told us that he was told that so by a superior so what you know why why would we question that you know um and i think that, that the only people that did that knew the truth wasn't even on the hill you know they were somewhere you know down in quang tree or fubai or you know they were someplace else what is the difference for you because you've got Marines who are lost in battle, but you you have remains. And so the idea, you know, the, the way we speak, you can go to this Marine's gravesite and, you know, visit the Marine, and we know that the remains are there. But with these missing, um, Tom Mahoney, you mentioned, uh, Gatewood, you mentioned, these guys, we know they were lost in war, and we can set up a stone in their memory, but there's nothing physical there of them, right? Does it does it make a difference? Because I'm sure right now you can bring to your mind's eye the faces of Marines you know who did not survive the war, but whose bodies came home. And then you can bring to your mind Tom Mahoney's face, but his body never did come home. Does it make a difference in how you remember them or what your thoughts and feelings are when you think about the difference between the one who does come home and the one who doesn't come home? Absolutely. And that's the reason that I went back over there looking for him. You did? Yeah, 2016. 